Hello, and welcome to Fairview Baptist Church. I'm Pastor John Boyacek. I'm so glad you could join us in worship today. I trust that you will be blessed. It's good to see you all here. I didn't know if I'd be here this morning. On Wednesday, I woke up not feeling very good. COVID symptoms, you know, aches and pains, shortness of breath, uh, runny nose, stuff like that. So Thursday, I, I couldn't get in for an appointment on Wednesday to get a test. So Thursday, I, I got one and I, I, I got the results on Friday. So the results were negative. So that's good. So I'm here just to spread the flu to all of you. Um, <laughs> Not an Omicron, so, uh, isn't it, uh, I don't know what's worse, to get the Omicron or to be in isolation for 14 days, I, it's, it's, it's crazy days, isn't it? Well, Christmas is a, a week away, less than a week away, and it can be a challenge to get that perfect gift for those people in your family. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this one, but this father bought his 14-month-old daughter a 1962 Austin Healy Sprite. And it's a very unique gift for his daughter, wouldn't you say? Especially a 14-month-old. And and someone there thinking, man, that is a good, wise move there. Just, uh, you know, just just, a way to get that special car that you want. It's really for my daughter. Yeah, okay. But, um, but no, it's, it's, it's better than that, the reason why that happened. He left his smartphone unattended and unlocked, and his 14-month-old daughter inadvertently opened up his eBay app and clicked a couple more times, and uh, he became the proud owner of a convertible. Fortunately, this convertible only cost about $250, and the father plans to keep and restore that car and maybe give it to her as a birthday present in the future. I'm sure the project of restoring that car will cost a lot more than $225. But the things that fathers will do for their children, um, this, this one over the top, uh, looking over, uh, over the mis- mischief that her, his daughter got into, but fathers, they do have their flaws, but most of them want to be generous to their children. They want to uh, provide gifts for their children, and at times want to be over-the-top generous. But at times, fathers don't know exactly what their children need. Fathers, they want to give good gifts. But trying to figure out what those good gifts are can be a challenge. We've been doing a series the past few weeks called The Coming of Christ. Looking at Isaiah chapter 9. And, and with Christmas, you usually think of the sun coming to this earth. And uh, God the sun coming to this earth. And... And, but there are four names that are given to the great deliverer, this great Messiah that Isaiah talks about 700 years before the coming of Christ. He, he calls it, uh, he names them Wonderful Counselor, and we looked at that a couple of weeks ago, and the Mighty God, the, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And one of those names that we probably don't dwell on that much is the Everlasting Father. Jesus The Messiah is called the Everlasting Father. The past few weeks, we looked at the wonderful counselor, the great strategist, the the one who has the great plan, and the plan that nobody really dreamt or imagined until it all played out in the end. Jesus, the great wonderful counselor. But then we know that he's the mighty God. Uh, He had to be God to do this. He was born as a baby like you and me, and lived a perfect life and died on the cross and went into eternity and conquered sin, conquered death. Only mighty God can do that. But today we're looking at the name Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. We're told that Jesus is the Everlasting Father. What does that mean and and how does that apply to us? So let's look at Isaiah chapter 9 once again. Again, the context here is uh, the people of God are overrun by the Assyrians. Uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, these different regions in Israel, were conquered by the Assyrians. They were obliterated. All the people are taken out as slaves uh, of the Assyrians. 
And the army is standing at the door of Jerusalem. And the people are, um, are seeing pain. The people are seeing hardship. The, the, the people are seeing destruction there and, and hopelessness. And Isaiah gives us prophecy about the people in the future. They're, they're looking backwards. And they're saying, yeah, there's no more darkness. In fact, there's a lot of good things going on. Chapter 9, verse 1, it says this, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in darkness, in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing plunder. For as the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Before we go any further, let's pray, shall we? Lord God, thank you for your word and what it teaches. I thank you for the way that you spoke 2,700 years ago to the prophet Isaiah, to these people who were struggling, people facing gloom and, and challenges. But you told them that you had a greater plan. And today, once again, Lord, you tell us that you have a greater plan for us. And we thank you that we can look into your word and find out what that plan is. We thank you for the truth that we can reflect on once again. So I pray, Lord, that you'd guide my thoughts and you'd guide our thoughts as we look into your wonderful truths of your word today. May, may they penetrate deep within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're told that he is going to be called the Everlasting Father. The, the everlasting father. Um, in verse 6, we're, we're told, um, sorry, in, in verse 3 it says, You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing plunder. It talks about enlarging the nation. Why would a nation be enlarged? Partly because there are fathers who are helping to enlarge the nation. There's fathers who are bringing support and comfort and protection for the family. And this everlasting father, we got a picture of it here, allowing the nation to enlarge, to increase, because he is allowing that to happen. And we're told that in verse 6, it says, And the government will be on his shoulders. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. We're told in verse 7. The government will be on his shoulders. We're talking about managing of people, managing of things, that will be upon this, this everlasting father, this, this heaviness, this burden of, of managing his people, his children. And we're told that of, of that greatness in this government and peace, there will be no end. It's going to keep expanding. It's going to keep expanding. It's going to keep expanding. And it's because of what our eternal father is doing, our everlasting father it's this expanding moment. It's an internal movement. And we're told that he will establish righteousness and justice, and it's going to be a perfect place that is everlasting. That's a glimpse that, that, that Isaiah gives to us about this Messiah being the everlasting Father. And some of us get confused with this term everlasting Father, referring to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. We get it confused with, with that of, with that of, um, with that of, of uh, the, the, the eternal Father. Um, it, the Trinity, we have God the Father, we have God the Son, 
We have God the Spirit. And we're told that, we're told that uh, God the Father is not God the Son, and, and God the, the, the Spirit is not God the Son or, or God the Father, and so on and so forth. So how can Jesus Christ be the everlasting Father? Well, Isaiah is not saying that Jesus Christ is the Father, is the, is the person of the Father. The Father is a separate person in the Godhead. When, when it's talking about the everlasting Father, I, Isaiah is, is not implying that Jesus is the Father. Everlasting Father is something that is about the Son, that, that is about Jesus Christ. So, so let's not get those two confused. Although at times they're intertwined and at times they can become uh, confusing. But, but there are separate people. Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. God the Father is God the Father. God the Spirit is God the Spirit. And so we get a glimpse of the everlasting Father here in this passage in, in chapter 9 of, of Isaiah. But another way to understand everlasting Father, He is the Father of eternity. It, it's not emphasized so much in, in Isaiah chapter 9, but in, in John chapter 1, 1 through 3, when, when John talks about Jesus coming to this earth, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is, is the Word here. And we're told that He was God in the beginning. And through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In terms of everlasting, Jesus was there at the beginning. Uh, Jesus was there before the beginning. And, and that's, that's who Jesus is. He didn't show up on the scene as a baby. That's the first time He ever came into existence he was there before time. That's Jesus. Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says, it says this, For in him, that's Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and all things hold together. So, so we have this aspect of, of him being eternal, okay? He, he was there um, at the beginning of creation. Um, he, he was there uh, in heaven, and he created the earth, and he created the visible and invisible things. And we're told that all things hold together in him. He, he cares for it. That everlasting Father cares for us. He's eternal. And so we're, we're to, we see within here, he's eternal, He's in perpetuity. He, he's without end. And those are the things that describe Jesus Christ as being eternal. But um, Jesus coming to earth as a baby, it was not the first time Christ came on the scene of eternity. He was there at the beginning. That's what these passages and many other passages talk. It, it, it's hard to picture Jesus as the everlasting father in Mary's arms. But he had to become a baby, in order to identify with us, in order to say he is an everlasting father. But the other thing is, in a way he identifies with his father, he identifies as God. And, and we're told that in John chapter 10, verse 30 and 38, Jesus shows that he is God. He says, I and the father are one. He's not saying, I, I, I am the father. He says, we're one, we're, we're together. Uh, no one understands that the father is in me and I am in the father. Uh, separate persons, but, but, uh, uh, but, but they're part of the Godhead. He is God. And, and as he talks to the uh, Pharisees and also to Philip, he says this in John 14, verse 9 and 10. He says, have I been with you so long? If you still don't know me, Philip, uh, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Uh, do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? He's saying that he's fully God here. He, 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 and he says that he identifies with his heavenly Father too. So, everlasting Father has an aspect of him being God. But there's also another aspect of him being the first. Uh, as Abraham uh, is called the father of our faith, he, he was also, uh, God called him to fo follow after him. And, and Abraham's called the father of our faith at times. But, and and by faith, Abraham started the nation that the Messiah would come from. So many people look at him as, as the father. Like someone who's never done that before. Someone who established a new precedent that other people should follow after. 
we call many people who are the first fathers. We have the fathers of confederation in Canada here. The three, 33 men who, who founded our great country of Canada with probably the, the most famous one that we remember his name, Sir John A. Macdonald. But in the States, they would have their founding fathers, the eight founding fathers uh, who wrote the Constitution in the United States, George Washington and, and Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, Tom and Jefferson, and, and some others who, who were there. They call them the founding fathers, the ones who put these principles in place that established this country. In some ways, Jesus is the first the first human to do certain things, the one who started it and passed it, passed it on to his children for their benefit. And so Jesus is the first. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, it says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This passage is talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and talking about Jesus Christ being the first one to ever rise from the dead. He's, he's the first one to do that. And because he's the first one, those who are in Christ will also rise from the dead. Those who have died will also rise from the dead. It's something we get to look forward to because of what Christ has done. He's the first. In a way, he, he's, he's the father of it. We have a, another passage, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. It's talking about Adam being the dust of the earth. He was born in... And, and he died, and, and this, this second person, who really is the first, uh, he's the first one of heaven. He's the one who, who, who left this earth and went into heaven. He's the one who rose from the dead. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Another, another first. Or Colossians 1.15 says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. We, we see Jesus Christ being the image of God. Okay, If you see Jesus, you've seen God. Um, the firstborn over all creation. The firstborn. The, the, the first one. The one who has supremacy. In, in, in a way, a, a father over everything. Or Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church. The head of the church. Uh, the bride is the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Again, the firstborn from among the dead, having supremacy. The father, the, the one who started it all, the, the one who, who, who gave us the way to do that. The everlasting father. And so this first thing, this, this great concept of, of Jesus being the everlasting father. It's a great concept just to ponder a little bit here. Now, when it comes to being the first or being the founding fathers or being a father, fathers can be flawed. Fathers can be flawed. Probably the person who's called the father of, modern, of the modern automobile would be Henry Ford. Um, he got the automobile out to the masses and he used mass production uh, in manufacturing the Model T automobile. Not only shaped the economy and, and, and industry, but the values of the 20th century Americans. And um, one writer says this, it says, a, a 2005 biography of Ford tells the story of a man who achieved incredible fame and fortune and described how in the end, this gifted man was undone by his own success. Ford loved the ordinary folk and they loved him back. And by 1920, half of all cars in the U.S. roads were Ford's. But it wasn't just the cars that Ford was selling. He preached the good, a, a new gospel to a public raised on Puritan ideals of delayed gratification and self-controlled. And Ford, he believed that money was for spending and that workers should use their income to buy products that would improve their lives. Products like the Model T, of course. But he, he was seen as a hero uh, for making it possible for the average family to own a car. And Ford's opinion was sought out for every area of life, from world peace to marriage to child care. Things haven't changed so much in these days. When people make it a fame and fortune, everybody seeks out their opinion on scientific things, on family raising and, and other things for world peace. The, past, the, the writer goes on, the adulation of others ultimately convinced Ford that he was infallible and led him to a ruinous bad decisions. It blinded him to his own hypocrisy 
as he preached family values and and old-fashioned virtues, and yet he kept a mistress. It may have also driven him to destroy his his only child. The, The older Ford offended his son's gentle style, offended by his son's gentle style and superior education, ruthlessly undercut him in every turn, only then to mourn grievously when Edsel died young. Ford's last days were sorrowful. On a visit to the house where he had lived as a newlywed, he told his chauffeur, I got a lot of money, and I'd give every penny of it right now just to be here with Mrs. Ford. On this earth, everywhere, we see flawed fathers. You can, if you're a father, you can turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a flawed father. We, we all are. But Jesus Christ, in a way, is the perfect father, the everlasting father. He, he, he's, he's the father who gives perfect gifts. He, he's the father who gives the gifts that we need, the, the things that we, we, we don't even know we need, he gives it to us. And, and so we're told that his character is described as eternally. And he, he's consistent and unchanging. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he's consistent. He's unchanging. He, he's that type of person. You and I aren't consistent. and Sometimes we change too much. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's eternally that way. We, we, we can rely on him no matter what comes our way. In the New Testament, the title Alpha and Omega is given to him in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. It uses the first letter of of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, and and the last, Omega, to symbolize that Christ is before everything and will surpass everything. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. It's the type of God he is. Before everything, and will surpass everything. Before you, before me, will surpass you, and will surpass me. But there are other aspects of, of him being the everlasting father. He, he has eternal encouragement that he gives to us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16 tells us this. He says, may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and the God of the Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Do you need encouragement today? He gives eternal encouragement and good hope for all eternity. Something to to dwell on. Something that Jesus Christ does. The perfect Father gives that to us. Or His eternal presence is with us. Don't really think about this passage when thinking of His eternal presence. I haven't really pondered this until I, I looked at it again this week. Matthew 28, 20, and surely... This is Jesus talking. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I'm going to have my presence with you, not just now, not just through those tough times, to the very end of the age. And we're also told that he gives eternal life. And John 14, verse 19 says, Before long, the world will not see me anymore. You will, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. Because Jesus lives, because he's the eternal one, because he has, has given us victory over sin, over death, we can also live. We also have eternal life. He gives eternal life. These are the gifts that the eternal Father gives to us. Jesus Christ, everlasting Father. But to be part of God's family, you need to receive the gift. You need to receive a gift. Uh, many people think that everyone's a child of God. Uh, the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man are really not biblical ideas. They're not biblical ideas. God is the creator, sustainer, and, and judge of humanity. Yes, he is. But the Bible te- wants us to understand that he's not the father of everyone. He, he's not the father of everyone. He only becomes our father when we stand in, in a unique relationship with him. God can only be our Father because of the Redeemer. Because of what Jesus Christ has done. Because of the fall, because of the sin, none of us comes into this world with a relationship with God. At least not a good one. 
The Bible says that without Christ, we're apart from God. We are alienated from God. We are not a child of God. We're not part of God's family. But Christ and his work on the cross, we can enter his care, the care of the everlasting Father. Have you received that care? Have you turned your life over to Jesus Christ and received his cleansing and forgiveness? Can you say, I am now a child of God because of what Christ has done? I received his cleansing and forgiveness because of of the first things he's ever done, as he was the first to conquer sin, the first to conquer death, the first to rise from the dead. And have you embraced that cleansing and forgiveness that only he can provide because he is the Father that provides forgiveness? Jesus Christ. Have you received? Three years ago, things changed for me at Christmas, and Christmas is different from my whole family. Uh, Stanley and I both watched as our earthly fathers entered eternity three years ago. Now, we don't wish them back, but we miss them. Christmas just isn't the same since they've gone. Uh, Sandy and I were used to rituals as a family of what our, our fathers would do. Um, on Christmas Day, if we were at their house, uh, they would be the ones handing out the gifts. Our fathers would be doing that. Uh, for the Christmas meal, they would be the ones who would say grace at the Christmas meal. Uh, it was just that ritual. It was just the way it was. It's just what our dads did. And no longer is it like that anymore. Me being the oldest son in my family, I, I feel a, a heavier burden, a heavier weight of caring for my mother and also being the responsible sibling in my family. My other siblings are responsible, but, <laughs> but um, I think I'm, a, I'm the only sane one in my family at times. <laughs> but there, there are those things that we miss. Now they're gone. And some of you have similar thoughts of, of your father. Maybe your father's still alive and you're thankful for that they are. Um, maybe some of you are saying, no, my father's in eternity now. He was a good father. But, but some of you may not be thinking the same good thoughts of, as, a, as a father. Maybe your father was absent in your life. And maybe your father was abusive. Maybe your father was just aloof. But what Christmas does, it brings to us an everlasting father. Jesus Christ, coming in the form of the baby, but he, he provided a way to give us a, a different family, a greater family, uh, something better, something stronger, something perfect that we need in a father. Those of us who are fathers, we fall short, and we really need to look to Jesus as the role model for a fatherhood, the way a father should truly be. And Jesus Christ is the one that can give your dad and can you, and give you and the rest of your family eternal life. He's the only one who can do that because he is the eternal father. The one who brings us into an everlasting family. Yeah, our, our families on earth can be a little bit dysfunctional, but Jesus Christ brings us into an everlasting functional family. The one who brings hope. And so this Christmas, as we celebrate we celebrate the, the one who is wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. And may we celebrate the everlasting Father as, as we see that in Jesus Christ. May he be praised in that. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for the way that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be the first in many things. Uh, to be the father-like figure that we need in the flesh, to show fathers how to live, to show children how to walk, to show people how to live their lives. Lord God, thank you for the way that you provide it for us to come into an eternal family through you, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Thank you for your gift of, of salvation. And, and thank you for this wonder that we can ponder how you are the first, how you provide for us the perfect gifts that we need. 
I uh, thank you, Lord, for this, this time together. In Jesus' name. I'm so glad you're able to join us today in worship. If you have a need, a prayer request, feel free to reach out to us at the church here. You can give us a call or you can also email us. God bless you.